Chapter 22 Doors Scott Warren took the 2.30am count. Unlike a standing count, when inmates stood to attention at the end of their beds, this one only required Scott to lean over the gantry and count heads. He'd only wake the inmates up if he couldn't see someone. When he was done, Scott clanked along the metal gantry to the control room. If things went as planned, the escape wouldn't be noticed until the next count, which was due in four hours. Scott reached the control room at the centre of the H-shaped cell block and tore a form off his clipboard. He handed it to the chunky figure of Golding, who sat at a three-metre-long console covered in switches, surveillance monitors and lights. Golding stared at the sheet as Amanda Voss came towards him and handed him another. No escapes, boss. The petite 23-year-old grinned. Golding picked up a telephone and called the central control room. Hey, Keith. This is cell block T for trouble. I'm calling an account of 257 inmates at 2.37 in the a.m. Situation here is all normal. Warren rolled his chair back so he could put his feet up on the console and picked up a newspaper. As he did this, a buzzer sounded, accompanied by a flashing red light. Golding angrily flung down his newspaper. Those frickin' doors. Cell T4, side entrance B. One of you go and shut that thing up. I gotta take a dump, Scott said guiltily, looking towards the toilet. Can you deal with it, Amanda? Good people sometimes get hurt when you're trying to catch bad ones. When the door began to slide, James's conscience tripped over the idea of laying out a girl, but the mission depended on him holding his nerve. His fist smacked Amanda in the temple with enough force to knock the opposite side of her head against the edge of the metal door. There's no such thing as a good head injury, but a clean shot to the thinnest part of the skull was unlikely to leave Amanda with anything more than a mild concussion and a two-day headache. James dragged Amanda's unconscious body backwards and lowered her to the floor at the bottom of the spiral staircase. Come on, James whispered anxiously to Curtis. He wanted the door closed before any other inmates spotted the opening and decided to come with them. Curtis stepped through and slid the door shut. As James put on Amanda's ADOP baseball cap, then unbuttoned her black shirt and pulled it on. Combined with his black trainers and a pair of Curtis's black tracksuit bottoms, James could pass as a prison officer provided nobody looked too hard. Tie her up before she comes to, James ordered. Ankles and mouth gag, then tie her hands around the stair rail. Use the constrictor knot, like I showed you. Curtis had a couple of James's plated ropes slung over his shoulder. While he tied up Amanda, James swiftly ran up the spiral stairs and crept across the rail to the weapons rack. He grabbed a can of pepper spray and tucked a stun grenade into his pocket as Scott came through the door. James looked behind to make sure Curtis was still out of earshot. You okay? James asked. Scott nodded. Go for my nose and make it look real bloody. Be careful around Golding. He was a football player at high school. Use the handcuffs in the blue storage cupboard behind the console. James stepped back into a fighting stance and thrust his palm at the base of Scott's nose. Blood trickled over Scott's lips as he laid himself down on the metal floor. James ripped the safety pin from a can of pepper spray. He shot a quick blast into Scott's hair and face, then quickly crammed a piece of balled-up rag into his mouth. Sorry, mate, James whispered as he rolled Scott onto his chest and began tying his wrists. Curtis was coming up the spiral stairs a little too noisily for James's taste. Scott went limp, as though James had knocked him out. Shh, James said. Is she well tied? Curtis nodded. Just how you showed me. Did you get her ID badge and swipe card? Of course, Curtis whispered, grinning as he looked down over the rail. I never thought I'd see the view from up here. James unhooked an electric shock device from Scott's belt and stripped everything out of his pockets, including his keys and wallet, before shuffling down to tie his ankles. He threw Curtis the bunch of keys. One of those works the gun locker, James explained. Curtis opened the clear plastic front of the cabinet while James bent Scott's legs up and began tying the bindings on his wrists to the bindings on his ankles. Curtis took one of the large baton round guns. Looks complicated, he said. Help me move him, then I'll show you. They pushed Scott's body to the inside of the gantry so that the inmates below couldn't see him. 
James grabbed a small cylinder of compressed gas from the locker and snatched the gun from Curtis. I watched the hacks do this the other day, James explained. Screw the gas cylinder on the top of the gun, like so, turn the valve, then you break her open and give us a baton round. Curtis handed James one of the fat plastic slugs. James slid it into the barrel, closed the gun, and handed it to Curtis. Only fire if we have to, James said. You know how noisy they are. Curtis shoved more pepper spray, stun grenades, and rounds for the baton guns into his pockets while James armed another gun for himself. James opened the door at the end of the gantry. The short corridor led to the control room. James kept his back to the wall as they crept forward with their guns poised. When James reached the end, he poked his head into the control room and eyeballed Golding, who sat with his feet on the console, reading the sports page. It was eerily silent, apart from the hum of the air conditioning. We've got to distract him from the console or he'll hit the alarm, James whispered. Curtis nodded, as James crouched down and pulled out one of Scott's coins. He rolled the coin out into the room. Golding heard it drop in the middle of the floor and looked over the top of his newspaper. You've dropped a quarter down here, Scott, Golding said. He stared for a few seconds, before shrugging and going back to his newspaper. James looked at Curtis, shaking his head with frustration. He rolled another coin. This time, Golding looked put out. Too lazy to stand up, he slapped his newspaper down and wheeled his chair backwards towards the coins. What's going on there, Scotty? You got a hole in your pocket or something? As Golding spun his chair around to look down the corridor, James and Curtis both fired. The rounds hit Golding in the chest and stomach. His chair shot backwards before tipping over. The fat man roared as he blasted the chair out of his way with a powerful kick and rolled over, struggling to stand up. James's ears were whistling from the gun blast as he ran towards Golding and drenched his face in pepper spray. See what we do when we catch you! as he slumped blindly back to the floor, trying to rub the spray out of his eyes. Scott! Amanda! Where the hell are you? They won't be along anytime soon, Curtis gloated. When we get you two in the hole, I'm going to come in after you and bust every bone in your bodies. Golding had plenty of fight in him, and James didn't fancy a tussle with somebody so heavy. He pushed another plastic baton round into the gun and held it menacingly in Golding's face. Although classed as a non-lethal weapon, the baton round was deadly if fired into a vulnerable area from close range. Hands in the air, fat boy, James shouted ferociously. When the muzzle touched his face, Golding put his arms up and allowed Curtis to knot them together. After this, he let Curtis stuff a piece of cloth in his mouth and tie a gag over it. Meanwhile, James located the rack of handcuffs Scott had told him about. It took both boys to drag Golding a few metres across the polished floor towards the staircase leading down to the reception room. James cuffed Golding's hands around the top stair rail. Curtis cruelly stepped on the bracelet, so it closed down a couple of extra notches. Remember when you put them on me? Curtis snarled. You like them nice and tight, don't you, Golding? Golding screamed curses into his gag as the boys ran back to grab their guns. James noticed Golding's backpack under the console. He tossed out a baseball magazine and sandwich box and stuffed the pack with baton rounds, pepper spray and stun grenades before slinging it over his back. Curtis found a lightweight black jacket with the Arizona Prisons Department logo on it, which had belonged to Amanda Voss. He zipped it over his black t-shirt and found that it fitted okay. The boys sprinted downstairs, emerging through an unsecured door into the reception room on the ground floor. James jogged towards the exit door and swiped Amanda's card through the lock. He smiled with relief when it clicked. Keep calm, James said, as they stepped out into fresh air. Remember, it looks suspicious if we run. James swiped the card again and they passed through a wire gate into the main prison compound. The tarmac road went arrow straight, all the way down to the exit. The only light came from a few lamps around the wire fences of the cell blocks and the glowing watchtowers around the distant perimeter. A passing refuse cart and a wave from a hack taking a cigarette break was the only excitement during the eight minute walk towards the sally port, but James tortured himself with images of sirens, gunfire and the savage beating he'd undoubtedly take if the hacks recaptured him. 
A hundred meters shy of the vehicle gates, there was a giant signpost ordering everyone to follow a color-coded line painted on the asphalt. Red for inmates under transportation, yellow for visitors, and green for staff. The area beyond the sign was floodlit and CCTV cameras were perched every place you looked. Curtis's voice was quaking. We're never going to pass through this. Act normal, James whispered. We're dressed like staff. We have swipe cards. Unless the emergency siren goes off, there's no reason for anyone to look at us too hard. The green line ended at the door of a small metal shed marked staff only. James peeked through the window into a small room with a line of vending machines. A miserable looking hack sat on a plastic chair drinking from a tiny cup. James swiped his card in the entrance door, went up two steps and cautiously poked his head into a narrow corridor that smelled of floor polish. Look sweet, James said. They stepped inside, passing by the frosted glass entrance of the room with the vending machines, then dashing along the corridor towards the staff exit. James swiped Amanda's card through the lock on the door. A man's voice came out of a loudspeaker. James hoped it was the friendly Mr Shorter in the central control room, but he had no way of telling. Look up at the camera, state your name and staff ID. Uh, Voss, Amanda, Y465, James said, trying his best to sound like a girl. Who's your buddy? The loudspeaker asked. Curtis looked uncertainly up at the camera. Warren, Scott, KT318. Hey, Scotty, you don't sound so good tonight. You got flu or something? Yeah, Curtis said uncertainly. Sorry to hear that, man. You go home and catch yourself a good rest. The door buzzed to indicate that it had been unlocked. James and Curtis passed through and walked along an enclosed path. They stood behind a red weight sign, while a chunky door built into the armour-plated wall of the sally port rumbled backwards. Once it was fully open, the boys stepped into a tunnel. When the door at their backs closed fully, a green bulb began pulsing above the door at the opposite end. James realised there was a slot for a swipe card. He couldn't remember if he was supposed to get interviewed a second time, and was relieved when the metal door began rumbling. As they stepped out of the secure compound, James spotted the sign pointing towards the staff car park and headed off briskly. Curtis was so shocked that he could barely open his mouth. Unbelievable, Curtis mumbled. Unbelievable. You're a genius, James. Don't count your chickens, James said, as they strode along a paved path through the night air. This is only the beginning. Chapter 23. Cars. James couldn't risk hanging out in the car park too long, but there were more than 50 parked vehicles and he couldn't walk straight up to Scott's without Curtis wondering how he knew which one it was. James aimed the plipper at every car until he got a blip and a set of flashing lights from a Honda Civic in the next row across. As they cut between two cars, a battered pickup rolled over a speed bump into the car park. The boys instinctively ducked as the truck pulled in a few spaces along from the Civic. The driver swung out his legs and paused on the edge of his seat to light a cigarette. James recognised the face as it glimmered in the match light. Frey, Curtis whispered anxiously. James had read Superintendent Frey's personnel file. It said he was a hard worker who thought of cell block T as his personal property, but nobody had expected him to turn up three hours before a shift. This was bad news. James had to think fast. Frey was wearing a football shirt and jeans, but even allowing time for him to change into uniform, maybe drink a coffee in the staff lounge and walk up to Block T, he'd still be discovering the tied up hacks and raising the alarm within half an hour. Taking Frey out was the obvious option, but the boys were on open ground and there were CCTV cameras everywhere. James decided to let Frey go unmolested. He was far from certain it was the right decision, but he remembered how the PERT team had treated Dave and he didn't want Golding's prediction of them ending up in a dark cell getting a beating to come true. The further away from the prison they were if they got caught, the greater the chance that John Jones and the FBI team would be able to pull James out before the hacks got hold of him. Once Frey had locked his truck and headed off down the cactus-lined path towards the staff entrance, they ran across to the little Civic and jumped inside. It was a flash model, racing seats, 10-spoke alloys, and a beefy engine. 
James pulled a red seatbelt across his waist and hit the start button. He remembered what had happened the last time he'd driven a car, but there was too much adrenaline flowing for him to get hung up over it. He had to get on with the job. James kept the speed down on the road leading out of the prison, but once he hit the interstate, he couldn't hang about. The sporty little car had a firm suspension and the steering felt sharp. James got a sense of invincibility as he dodged between the three lanes of traffic. The 12-mile road to the dirt road turnoff took less than 10 minutes. A Ford Explorer with bull bars on the front was parked up, with its headlamp switched on, a few hundred metres past the junction. Grab the weapons, James said to Curtis, as he pulled the Honda up alongside the Ford and flung open his door. Lauren had left the engine of the four-wheel drive Ford running and was already belted into the front passenger seat. James climbed into the driver's seat and hit the gas as soon as Curtis slammed the door behind him. You got the car up here okay? James asked Lauren as he pulled onto the dirt road. Uncle John didn't wake up, Lauren nodded. I got his roadmaps and worked out the route to Los Angeles. She looked behind. And you must be Curtis. Hey, Curtis smiled. Good to meet you, Lauren. Where'd you learn how to drive? Me and Dave taught her, James explained. We took her with us a couple of times when we were out on the rampage. I'm a bit short to reach the pedals, Lauren added, but there's hardly any traffic on the road up from our house. What you got in the backpack over there? Curtis asked. Clothes, money, toiletries, Lauren explained. I even managed to sneak into the bedroom and get John's 44. we We've got a proper gun? Curtis asked. Where is it? Curtis didn't need an answer. He spotted the huge revolver on the armrest between the two front seats. The 4x4 seemed like it was on sleeping pills after driving the nippy little Honda. James pressed the gas pedal as they hit the interstate, and it felt like nothing happened at all. 44 Magnum, Curtis grinned as he picked up the gun. Dirty Harry special. You can blow a guy in half with one of these. Lauren looked out the window as the donut place whizzed by. James, you tit. We're going the wrong way. What? James gasped. You turned the wrong way when we pulled onto the interstate. Ass. There was a metal barrier between the lanes. James started looking for a junction where he could pull off and turn around. Didn't you tune that radio? James asked. Oh yeah, Lauren said, reaching forward and flicking it on. We saw the superintendent of our cell block in the prison car park, James explained. We're not going to get anything like the four hours we'd hoped for. We'll be lucky if we get another 20 minutes before the police are on our tail. James spotted a break in the barrier and swung the tall car into a wide arc, across a strip of scrub in the middle of the road and into the opposite lane. A sedan car blasted its horn as the driver slammed her brakes to avoid shunting them up the back. Whoops, James said as he floored the gas pedal and began slowly picking up speed. So how far is it to the border with California? Just under 60 miles, Lauren said. Los Angeles is 200 miles further than that. It's a five-hour journey if we don't stop. We'll have to stop at least once, for gas. Traffic was light and the unlit road almost straight. When James checked the speedometer, he was doing 80 miles an hour, which was over the limit, but in line with what most of the other traffic was doing at this time of night. If he drove any faster, he'd look conspicuous. The radio station was holding a phone in and the topics were, are there alien beings walking among us? And who is the greatest popular musician of all time? As far as James could work out, most of the people who rang in believed that the answer to both questions was Elvis Presley. The digital clock on the dashboard said 3.43 when the DJ cut off a caller and got seriously excited. We're picking up breaking news of an escape from Arizona Max. Two male escapees, both aged 14. That's 1-4, folks, not 4-0. One prison officer is believed to have died during the escape. Arizona police are setting up roadblocks at strategic locations. The escapees are described as white skinheads, going by the names of James Rose and Curtis Oxford. Both are convicted murderers, and police say that you should treat the boys with the same degree of caution as you would if you spotted a dangerous adult offender. That's red hot news, listeners. Stay tuned, because we're going to be keeping you up to date on this all night long. You killed someone? Lauren gasped. Scott Warren's fake death had always been part of the plan, but they had to act surprised in front of Curtis. 
We didn't kill nobody, Curtis said. One of the hacks must have had a heart attack or something, James said. This is so bad, Curtis said. If you kill a hack, you're done for. They stick you in solitary, and the hacks make your life hell. Spitting in your food, playing loud music right outside your cell until it drives you nuts. Then we'd better not get caught, James said. Oh God, Curtis said, shaking his head and sobbing. What do you want me to do? James shouted bitterly. Go back and kiss him better? What if there is a roadblock? Curtis asked. We've only got one proper gun and they'll shoot us to pieces if we try to ram through. Just stay cool and give me a chance to think, James said. Lauren, how far are we from the California border? Lauren looked at the map spread out across her legs. 35 miles or so. They can have roadblocks in California too, you know, Curtis said. Of course, James said. But there can't be many cops out here in the desert, and they don't know what way we're going. The further out you get, the more roads they'd need to block. So if we hit a roadblock, I'd bet on it being sooner rather than later. James watched the lines of Cat's eyes whiz by for a few more minutes. A woman called the radio phone in and said that the escapees should get the death penalty, even though they were only 14. The follow-up callers all agreed. Okay, folks, a little more news on the jailbreak. Police are now looking for a silver Honda Civic IS. Apparently, that's a distinctive Jap box with fancy wheels and a little wing over the back window. James smiled. We're one step ahead of him. The cops will check out your uncle's house pretty soon, Curtis said. They'll find this car is missing. But it buys us some time, James said. Up ahead, Lauren squealed. Sitting on the right gave Lauren half a second's advantage in spotting the flashing blue lights blocking the road. Roadblocks are usually positioned after bends, so that approaching traffic doesn't get a chance to pull off, although they have to leave stopping room or cars would smash into them. There was a queue of about a dozen cars, passing through a single lane that had been created by parking two cop cars with their lights flashing across the two other lanes of the interstate. Every car was being stopped while an officer inspected the passengers inside with a flashlight. James pulled into the side of the road and slammed to a halt. He looked back over his shoulder. All four tyres screeched as he did a backwards U-turn through the traffic. If the cops hadn't seen this manoeuvre, they certainly heard the horns of two approaching cars blasting as they swung out of his way. One car sideswiped the metal barrier in the centre of the road, making a shower of orange sparks as it jutted to a halt. Damn it, James shouted as he pushed the stick back into drive and rammed the gas pedal, heading into the oncoming traffic. The police cars in the roadblock sounded their sirens and began moving towards them as James noticed a break in the metal barrier and ploughed across the central reservation onto the correct side of the road. Lauren, James said anxiously, where's that backpack I brought with me? Down by my feet, Lauren said. Take it, it's full of weapons. They're not looking for you, so as soon as we stop, I want you to jump out. Lauren nodded. I'll see what I can do. You can't stop, Curtis screamed. We've got to get out of here. If they catch us now, that hack's dead. Our lives won't be worth shit. I got you this far, James shouted back angrily. Just calm down. Screw you, Curtis hissed, furiously grabbing the magnum off the armrest as the car pulled up in the sand at the side of the road. Lauren dived out with the backpack and rolled down a modest slope into some scrub. Both cop cars pulled up, one in front and one behind the 4x4. A cop jumped out of each car with their gun pulled, one male, one female. There's no way I'm going back to prison, Curtis yelled. The man stood behind in a covering position while the lady cop jogged through the headlight beams towards the big Ford with her handgun pointing. Turn off the engine and put your hands on the steering wheel, the lady cop shouted. James did as he was told, but he heard Curtis cocking the gun. The cop didn't see Curtis until she got in close because of the tinted windows. There is no need for that, the cop said. James assumed Curtis had the magnum pointing at the cop but he glanced in the driver's mirror and realised Curtis was pointing it at himself. Curtis, don't! James shouted. James heard the gun click. A white light and a deafening blast flashed as a stun grenade exploded in the wheel hub of the front police car, ripping apart the tyre. 
Four more grenades exploded along the roadside, followed by a final blast that took out a tyre on the cop car at the rear. James, Curtis and the two cops were temporarily deafened and blinded by the pulses. A few passing drivers had wobbly moments, but the traffic was mercifully light, and the only harm done was a couple of tyre squeals and a car almost swerving off into the desert. Lauren had buried her face in the sand after laying the last grenade. She counted the explosions with her fingers plugged tightly in her ears. After the sixth blast, she jumped up and ran towards the male cop. Before he regained his sight, Lauren gave him a 90,000 volt nip with Scott's electric stun gun. He collapsed in a shuddering heap, where he would remain paralysed for the next couple of minutes. Lauren snatched the gun from the cop's limp hand and fired it harmlessly into the air above the Ford. The lady cop had regained enough hearing to duck as Lauren closed her down and zapped her with the stun gun. Lauren dropped the ammunition clips out of the police pistols and hurled the guns into the desert, then opened the driver's door next to her brother. James! Lauren shouted. James could barely hear Lauren's voice over the high-pitched whistling in his ears, but the white smears in front of his eyes were starting to clear. How many stun grenades was that? James asked. All of them. Lauren grinned as she clambered over her brother's legs and back into the passenger seat. Can you see to drive? It's getting better, James said as he reached forward and turned the key in the steering column to restart the engine. James rubbed his eyes while Lauren looked back at Curtis. He was lying across the back seat with a tear running down his face. What the hell just happened? Curtis asked, staring at the end of the gun. I'm not keen on guns, Lauren explained. I didn't load the Magnum because I didn't want anyone getting shot. It's for fright value only. You're nuts, Curtis screamed. The cops keep bullets in their guns, you know, little girl. Only so idiots like you can shoot themselves, Lauren screamed back. I wish I was dead, Curtis whined. Will you two shut up, James said anxiously. I'm trying to concentrate. He waited for a gap in the traffic before manoeuvring out between the two disabled police cars and pulling through the gap in the metal barrier onto the side of the road that headed towards California. As James put his foot on the gas, the steering wheel shuddered violently out of his hands. He nudged the pedal more gently and the car picked up a little speed. What's wrong? Lauren asked. No idea, James said, as he fought to keep the car going straight. But I did hear something go crunch the last time we passed over the barrier. They were doing less than 30 miles an hour and a truck was closing up behind at double that speed. The driver blasted his horn as he swung into the middle lane to overtake. James tried giving the accelerator another dab. The steering wheel almost ripped his arm off as the car veered dangerously towards the side of the passing truck. It's okay when it's slow, but I can't put any power down. What are we going to do? Lauren asked. God knows, James said, shaking his head. We're certainly not going to get anywhere near Los Angeles in this box of bolts.